morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to What's Happening Drake It. Today is Saturday, April 6, 2024, and this is our 61st episode. Thank you for joining us this morning on a special time. Uh, we've switched around a little bit, trying to switch things up, and this is the place where you're going to find out things that you won't be told in any other media source. What's Happening Drake It is an informational and political talk show and we bring you the news of the day what's happening in the merrimack valley area as well as drake it um, we plan to keep you informed and you'll get information here where you'll get from nowhere else we're coming from our overly ostentatious studios here at drake it access television and we are live on facebook at the same time i'm your host john zimini along with a couple of guest hosts today who are always part of our our crew here and we're going to start off with introducing you to Gordy Scott, the Teflon Don of uh, <laughs> DATV. How uh, is everything? Everything's great. We've been on a little bit of a hiatus. We've, yes, uh, you've with been, sports, with yeah. hockey and basketball, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. We, I uh, do have my referee banquet tonight, so that's a good thing. Oh, you're um, not going to the firefighters ball here in Drake? No, I have my referee banquet. So uh, we had a few of uh, our fellow referees pass away this past year, so they have a, uh, a nice so how, how many people will that endure? In, uh, in probably work? about 200, close to 200 wow. people. Yeah. So it's, so it's, it's all at Lindsay's the... tonight. So. Oh, great. Now, is that an MIAA thing? Or is uh, it... No, it's just for our board of all of our officials in the in the area. In the Merrimack Valley, Lowell, uh, Tingsboro, Drake it, um, Do they do high school games too? Yes. Oh, yes. Them, yeah. Yep. We that's... actually have one person on our board, uh, Julian Scott, that's doing NBA games. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. exciting, yeah. That's exciting. That's yep. exciting. And also in the house tonight with us is our resident architect and according to some a perennial candidate, but <laughs> <laughs> but we but you know, he keeps people on their toes. He's a guy that, that they don't want involved in any of the boards here in Drake it because of uh, his uh, you know, he's intelligent, he brings across a good uh, spectrum of knowledge in the area of zoning and building and what have you, and that's Phil Tebow. Hey, how, how are you, Phil? Very well, yourself? I'm doing good. No, I, I, I don't mean that as a knock, Phil, so don't... don't oh, you know. no, I know. I mean, I, I think you hear me kind of joking Joke about, about it, it yeah, too. That's it's why like, I'm, I took... So, you memory. know, I, I'm, I've always been of a philosophy that you take your victories and your defeats with the same enthusiasm. Right, so, right, you right. Know. Uh, But you know what? The thing is, you, at least you're giving people a choice and you're keeping the, the opposition on on their toes when you do well, run. Well, that is one thing that, you know, it's so often in, in politics and, and especially locally that, you know, a person runs and if they lose and they just kind of like go back into the, the, into the background and kind of uh, shy away from doing anything else. And I, I frustrate them by just hanging around. Oh yeah, you just keep <laughs> showing up. You just keep coming back for more. And it's not like you're not an intelligent person. Did you know, you, you know, I know you're not gonna say that, but you are a person who has knowledge of of many aspects of town government. They don't like that. No, 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 stop. Don't, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, thank we, you for embarrassing We me. also <laughs> have in our house a special guest uh, that is here to uh, talk about his candidacy, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, we wanted to make sure that you understand that we are on Facebook Live, and you can reach us uh, by sending us a message through our email, as well as, uh, you know, contacting us today. You can call us while we're on the air live, 978-957-4243, and uh, join in the conversation. And we are also streaming live on, uh, at, obviously, at drakeittv.org uh, and on uh, Comcast Channel 8, which you see now. We also have YouTube, a uh, YouTube channel, right? Yes, what do you do? What's you manage that? What's happening, Drake It? So we'll post this... Uh this show in a, a day or two after uh, it airs on live on TV. So uh, if you want to catch it on YouTube, you can at any time. Yeah. At our last show, we were uh, touting how we were, uh, we had over 35, uh, 3,400 um, people who were on our Facebook page and, and have liked us and follow us. But now we are approaching 3,600. Wow. We're over 3,500. So that's a big jump for us. And um, we're hoping to continue the momentum, even though we haven't been on the air as much. As Gordy alluded to, I've been um, uh, tied up with hockey and some other things. And, you know, in January, I fell, uh, got knocked over on the ice. 
And how is that healing? And, and it's it's getting better. <laughs> I got some movement, not full range, but I broke my elbow and my shoulder and had elbow surgery, so I've been out of commission a little bit. So uh, I kind of had to take a step back. But uh, we're back on track, and we're going to be here for the duration of this, at least this election, uh, you know, time. So join us if you want uh, at 978-957-4243. But before we do, we have a graphic from. Um, Sean Kelly of our uh, Mill City Weather. I think you have that, Nate. Uh, if you don't, let me know. Um, put that up right now. We got a forecast. He's not going to be here live today or on tape, but he was going to surprise us with a uh, with a weather graphic. Do you see that anywhere? I don't have anything now. Okay. Well, I guess it, it didn't make it through, but it's cold this weekend and it warms up next week. That's, That's it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So we'll be back on track because he informed me. Sean told me that he will definitely have something for us uh, on our next show next Saturday. We're going to continue with a Saturday uh, live show and taping for the next um, couple of shows um, because it's just more convenient for all of us to be able to get here. And on some a of Saturday. the candidates can get that we're interviewing yeah. can get here can on get a here Saturday. On. Sure. Um, so, what are some of the com upcoming events? We have a, a, a candidates forum coming up. So, yes, there is a candidates uh, debate forum uh, on April 10th, which would be Wednesday, uh, and I think that's at seven o'clock at Harmony Hall. And that's sponsored by a group of um, yeah, it's, it's essentially a, a similar group to the candidates night. Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not. I've, I'm not specifically sure of their current name, mm. uh, but it is an independent group. Now, um, the uh, <coughs> Citizens Against Reckless Development also have a forum, right? That's uh, that's correct, and that's being done as as a meet and greet. So, they're, I believe they're hosting it at the American Legion um, on the 25th. Yeah, uh, 27th, I think it is, but. I could be wrong, yeah, I, but the bottom line here is that's going to be a forum where you can walk in and talk to the candidates one on one. That is correct. There's no question and answer. Period. I, I don't. I believe right now there's not a if you want to call it a debate or question and answer period. Um, it's more of a mingle and, oh, and, okay. and speak with everybody. So uh, I, I think that format has a, certainly has a value that mm -hmm. you get to meet people informally. Um, if you want, I, I suppose that if the, the, the harsher term would be put the screws to them. Yeah. Uh, but you can do that more on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and you're probably more apt to get less of a canned response right. uh, than in a debate where each candidate has two minutes to make a statement and then two minutes, a, a minute to respond. And we also have the upcoming elections on Saturday, May 4th. That is correct. So, and that the uh, we will be posting that on our uh, Facebook page to make sure that people are aware that it's coming up, and the polls are open from seven to eight. That I'm not sure. I believe the selectmen may be um, setting that at their next meeting. Oh, okay. Um, plus, I believe there's also going to be some early voting available. There is, um, yeah. So we, we we'll, we'll make sure that gets posted. Yes. Also. So um, at this point, let's <coughs> jump right in and introduce our. Um, our new friend here, Sakawi Chow, who is a, a current member of the Lowell uh, City Council, and he has served as the first um, Cambodian uh, mayor of Lowell, right? And I think it was for the United States, am I right? The whole in, country. In, in the country, that's correct. Um, welcome to our show, Sakawi. Uh, thank you, John, and welcome back. And I feel honored to join this, uh, you three local celebrities <laughs> uh, uh, this morning. And I want to say good morning to everyone in Drake It. Uh, what's happening, Drake It? Um, it's, it's exciting to be here. Um, it's my first time on uh, your TV show. Right. But I'm not new to Drake It. I have owned uh, properties in Drake It um, in the past. And I have many friends uh, in Drake as well. Oh, great. So I feel very connected. But, you know, everything in the Merrimack region, we all connect it in some way, shape, or form. Sure. So it's really an honor to be here. So, Sakawi, you have a very interesting story, background story. So um, I'd like you to just open up by telling a little bit of the people who don't may not know you from the Lowell politics. Sure. And what your story is, how you immigrated from uh, Cambodia as a young man, a, a child with your sure. mom. And tell us a little bit about how you got here and why. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, again, my name is Sakari Chow. 
Uh, first and foremost, I am a candidate for the Registry of Deeds in North and Middlesex. The current Register, Mr. Dick Howe, he is, uh, he's going to deserve um, a well-earned uh, retirement uh, next year. And um, it has been an honor serving uh, the public, as you mentioned. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, I am the first mayor of color in the city of Lowell, and I, am, I was the first uh, Cambodian American mayor in, in the country, and I'm currently a three-term city councilor. Um, serving the public has been a tremendous honor for me, and uh, along with it carries the great responsibility of providing transparency and honesty in everything we do. Um, I am living the American dream, um, I, as you know, and um, that's what I want to do. The reason I run for the Register of Deeds is I want to protect the American dreams of home ownership. And as you were uh, leading me to talk about where I came from, uh, we did not have that, this transparency, this honesty in protecting home ownership. Um, in 1975, a few years after I was born, the Cambodian country fell into a tumultuous uh, time, civil war, the Khmer Rouge, Rouge meaning red in French, Cambodia uh, was very influenced by the, by the French culture. Um, so Khmer, Khmer Rouge meaning communist. The communists took over and uh, my father, so every, uh, the majority of the people, the majority of the country um, were farmers, my family were farmers, we were rice farmers and uh, orange orchard farmers, and because of the <coughs> Civil War, my father joined the army to fight to protect the country, and he did a, a, a really, really good job, so to speak. Um, he won a lot of battles, but when the Khmer Rouge took over in 1975, he was one to be, he was one of the first to be executed, leaving my mom with seven children. Wow. Um, myself included, I was the youngest of seven, and as you know, raising a family, whether you have both parents, uh, but especially a single mother is tough enough, but for my mom to try to keep all seven of her children alive during that time, it was a genocide, it was a time of uh, enslavement, you worked the mines all day long, uh, no freedom and so forth. The communists took away our farm, um, they took away our, our freedom, um, so it's, you know, it was one of those things that really, they call it, um, the Khmer Rouge call it year zero. They want to return the country. They want to return the time to year zero. But in my mind, now that I learn more about it, it wasn't even year zero, it was negative because, you know, it was <coughs> taken back thousand, thousand years of, of civilizations. And in 1979, uh, after the Khmer Rouge were out of the country, my mom saw the opportunity to took her family to escape Cambodia through the jungles, through the minefields, into uh, refugee camps because there was no way, because when you live in war times, and even though you have that momentarily um, peace moment, you never know when it's gonna come back again, when the war's gonna come back again and so forth. So my mom did not want us to survive through another years of under communist regime and so forth. Um, in the refugee camp, the, the Thailand Cambodian camp, we were sponsored by the Catholic Church to the, the suburb of Pennsylvania, the suburb of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So literally we were saved by God. And I don't mean that in a funny way, but in a, humor, a humorous way, but in a very grateful way. And we live in a convent because the church, we were, we were sponsored by the nuns themselves. Yeah. They wore habits, they had a parochial school, um, they didn't have a, a separate house, but they wanted to sponsor my mom because of her history. Um, you know, single woman, uh, she was not educated. At that time, women were not encouraged to be educated, but I don't think there was any more uh, courageous or bold women ever to really keep her whole family alive. And then after staying with the nuns for a couple of years, um, like all people who moved to the United States, who might go to the United States uh, throughout history, we want to be independent. We want to uh, pursue the American dream. We want to live the, the American life. Uh, we did go to uh, another state, believe it or not, at that time. In Iowa, there, there were more Cambodian families than in Pittsburgh, so we moved to Iowa for, for a couple of years. And then uh, we finally found out that 
all word of mouth, no internet, no high tech stuff back then in the 1980s. But through word of mouth, we found there were a lot of job and skilled labor market in a great low area. And that was important for my older siblings who needed jobs. Uh, you know, in Iowa, they work in meat packaging factory, in steel <coughs> factory. Um, back then, 1980s, the steel industry was, was huge, was booming, right? So everybody in the Midwest either work in a meat packaging industry or a steel factory. Of course, coming to uh, the East Coast, assembly line type of work was easy. You could work that all day long. <laughs> you could work uh, two shifts, three shifts. Uh, you know, we, uh, my, my siblings, they were used to working um, in the slave labor camp um, all these years, but to work and get pay, uh, to pay for apartment, to pay for food, to pay for clothes, transportation, for school, it's nothing. You can work 14 hours, 16 hours a day, and that, that was nothing. Mm. Um, so I, I can talk all... So all, congratulations on, so much. On, I, well, and we let you do that because yeah. I think that story of how you immigrated here is just compelling as, as to what we really, what, how we really wanted people to come to, to the country uh, as immigrants and as, but legally immigrants, you know, and, uh, and the way you came in was obviously during a very troubled time. I was a young man at the time, uh, Vietnam War was uh, in, that, in that time period just before that happened, before you came here. And um, I was one of those that were fortunate, although I regret that I didn't get drafted to go to Vietnam at that point. But um, all being said, um, we welcome you to the country and we, we certainly um, personif you personify what our country is all, all about, people coming here uh, and building a new life. So tell us, you, you went to Lowell Public Schools yes. and then you graduated from uh, Phillips Academy in Andover. A uh, very prestigious school, and um, you've got your degree in different different uh, avenues. So, you uh, you were involved with. Tell us a little bit about your business acumen before you got involved with politics. Uh, absolutely. Well, uh, I just want to say the, the American dream is alive and well in, in America. Uh, whether you uh, come here from a different country, you were born here in uh, many many generations, but really, it's it's the American dream. And when we first came to law, we grew up in the acre. That's where um, all the immigrants came in uh, mm -hmm. to, to the city. And we live in a two-bedroom um, apartment uh, with over 10 people. You know, there's only uh, eight people in my family. But as many people know, you know, you always find some unknown relative yeah. um, in the apartment <laughs> trying, trying to survive, trying to share the cost of, of, of living expense and things like that. And when I walk around the neighborhood, I walk to different neighborhoods of the city, uh, no cause whatsoever at that time, uh, when I saw um, like single family homes and uh, they have their nice uh, side yard, front yard, backyard, all green with trees, um, I did not know what it means. I thought they were, they were wealthy, right? The, <laughs> the owners of these families, uh, to have their own um, space and so forth, were wealthy. So always my dream that I wanted to, to own a home but I just didn't know how. We did not understand the, the system yet, the economic mm -hmm. system, the American system, and we did not understand the pathway, but I was very fortunate enough to uh, work very hard uh, in school. I believe in uh, education. Education is really the, the pathway to build yourself, to make yourself better, to support yourself, to support your family, to improve the community. So I had the opportunity to go to Phillips Academy and then McAllister uh, College and of course the American dream meaning that you're successful financially, mm -hmm. uh, right? So I always want to own um, um, a business. The opportunity came when I found ABC Financial Network, uh, which was also a, a mortgage company. And a couple of years later, we, uh, we joined a, uh, a net branch concept of mortgage. Uh, people did mortgage in the late 1990s, early 2000. Uh, they would understand what that means. So we opened a net branch called Merrimack Mortgage Company. And we started, we had a niche market. We have a lot of uh, first time home buyers um, <coughs> buying their homes. So for us, when we start the business, uh, we just wanted to make money, uh, that the, the, the concept of, of businesses. But when uh, we start closing on, on homes, the first time home buyers, uh, the couples, they, they were crying at the closing table. They never thought that they could own a home. And when I thought about it, 
they were owning a piece of the American dream. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think too many um, uh, much else in economics that you can actually own a, a really expensive, a, a large part of asset in your life, and that's owning a home. And you don't have to be uh, smart, you don't have to be college educated, um, you don't have to be born into a wealthy family. It's just work hard and save. And that's what a lot of these uh, people did. They would work uh, two, three jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the wife would work one job, the husband would work two jobs, they save up. And they save enough for a down payment. All of a sudden, they're on their way, they're on the pathway to becoming independent and to start building generational wealth. So it was much bigger than what I was doing, which was just to run a business successfully, um, to live the American dream myself, mm -hmm. but I was helping other people to achieve that American dream, to have that, that owner, uh, ownership um, of, of the future. And I think that's why my candidacy for the Registered Deeds is, is very important. I understand what it means to, to own a home. I understand what it means, um, how important it is to protect it. I think what's worse than never owning a home at all, I think everybody wants to own a home. Right. That, that's the pathway. But I think it's worse if you own a home and you're at risk of losing it because it's not easy <coughs> buying a uh, buying home, especially the first home. You're really putting all your life savings into it because for most people, they are working uh, paycheck to paycheck. They can only save a little bit uh, to buy a home. It's a long-term process. If you were to lose it through fraudulence, I don't think you could get that dream back again. And they would pretty much feel like their life has been wasted, right? right? And then it's not only a loss to themselves, it's a loss to their children right. and, and their grandchildren. And with the rising home prices these days, um, I thought the home prices, home value were expensive back in the 1990s yeah, and, and 2000. <laughs> Uh, I think the price of homes now pretty much have, have tripled. Oh, God. And, you know, it, it's literally it's once in a lifetime to be able to buy a home. I bought to have my first ownership. house. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm from Chelsea originally. Right, right. So I bought my first house and it was $5,000 for a three family. <laughs> right. But it was, it was a house that needed a lot of work. I, right. I bought a house that sure. was pretty much empty. Right. Um, but we, I bought a loan for 50000 bucks and I remodeled right. it back then, $50,000 totally gutted the place and fixed it. Right. And now, you know, I sold it 10 years later for three times, like you yeah. said, mm -hmm. about $160,000. And each time I've bought a new house, I've always gone up, right? Absolutely. So um, that is the American dream, you're right. And it's almost getting to a point of being prohibitive right now. But just a good segue on the whole story. And um, I'd just like to know, um, you have two other opponents, from what I gather, it's uh, Karen Casella, Am Correct. I right? Correct. And uh, Joe Reddy. Correct. Um, now, what sets you apart from those two candidates that you can entice voters to say, he's the guy that should be running the registry? Uh, thank you for that, for that question. So, um, I have um, private business experience um, in the mortgage business, in the real estate business. I've also had work in law firms, so I understand how important documentation uh, is in terms of having accurate um, and, and safe. And having done all that, I also have been in the public sector. I have served as city councilor, uh, as mayor. Um, together with those things, I am uniquely qualified for this position. The position that we are running for, we are basically applying for, it's a elected position. There's no one that um, earned, that deserves it. You have to fight hard for it, and that's what I'm doing. Um, I believe that with my background in the private sector business and the finance, and also how working collaboratively with um, municipal leaders, with state um, leaders, even at the federal leaders, I will bring a unique perspective, unique skill sets that I don't think the other two candidates have. Um, I think one of the most important thing now, uh, first of all, I want to say that Mr. Dick Howe has done a tremendous job in modernizing the registry. It's one of the most uh, modernized uh, registry in the state and in the country, but technology is, is changing and what we need to come to the register now is more funding, which I think that uh, we don't have. And with my background being on the city council and especially being the mayor the last uh, two years, I uh, realized for now how important is that good relationship with other municipal leaders, with the state leaders, with the federal leaders. And I'm around to represent 10 communities, but the past two years what I have found 
have a great relationship with all these leaders, we actually got more fundings into the city flow. And if I'm lucky enough to be elected to the register, I believe I can bring more fundings from the state, from the federal, to expand the service. Uh, technology is changing, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, troubling risks to the registry is you have the threat of, of fraud, right. um, of being, um, lack of a better word, uh, of being hacked. Right. Um, so we need to really improve our technology even further. Without the funding to expand the technology program, uh, we are ahead right now, but technology changed so fast, we could easily fall behind. Right. Um, one of the things that I would like to do, and I hate to share my ideas right now because I'm yeah. sure that other <laughs> but you candidates yeah. uh, will listen, but one of the things that we need to do is to integrate AI. Um, AI technology, AI is so important in every facet of the economy uh, right now. We can use AI to not only improve customer service, but to improve secure, security as well. But another thing that uh, people have not talked about, uh, when we digitalize all the documents from the past couple hundred years or so, and uh, you know, when the deeds were recorded, um, so let's just say a long time ago, right? Yeah, right. Um, handwritten, be beautiful penmanship. So when we are digitalizing right now, basically it's scanning, and there's no way of telling what those written um, handwriting say. Mm -hmm. With AI technology, um, AI could actually read those handwriting and could provide that as indexes or as storytelling. And a lot of people, um, you know, besides the professionals who are using it, like real estate professionals, uh, bankers, um, attorneys, uh, municipal leaders, there's a lot of historians, or a lot of individuals are interested in, in genealogy. Right. And those documentations, if you were able to write those, if you were able to read those narrative, it provides such rich history of the homes, of the towns, of the city, um, of, of, of the, the family, of the country yeah. as well, because um, you know a lot of laws change pertaining to deeds to how it was, right? right. So, and it's it's very very interesting the way you can use technologies to really improve um, uh, interest in enriching uh, the culture. So you don't have to be a professional, uh, a real estate professional, an attorney to really utilize the registry of deeds. Sure. Uh, with technology, you can make it more engaging, more interesting, more interactive. Phil, you had a question? Yes, so I mean, you ask most, most people, you know, what does an elected official do? And if you're talking about a city councilor, town selectman, or, you know, a state rep or, or senator, everybody has a basic idea of what they're doing. You say register of deeds, and people say, well, they register the deeds. And so I guess my, my question to you is, what is your understanding of what your roles will be? Absolutely. That's, that's a great question. So, so the core mission of the registry is to record land, record land records, uh, to safe keep it, to safeguard it, to keep it safe, and to provide transparency, to provide access um, to individuals, to professionals, to peer users. Those are really the core mission. And we have wonderful clerks to have um, many years of experience, decades of experience, who can do all of that. And as the register, the elected position is for us to provide leadership, is for us to provide vision. In addition to managing uh, the staff, uh, the daily routine to provide customer service, which um, the clerks are really at, uh, at the front line uh, through training and I, they're all very experienced. I have faith in all the clerks, uh, the current clerks uh, right now, but the register being the elected uh, position you provide the leadership, how can we improve the customer service? What else is needed? For example, if, you know, when we did mortgage um, back, I'm, I'm kind of dating myself uh, a little bit. Uh, You're a young man, don't worry about it. There are two primary concerns for real estate professionals, for attorneys, for uh, buyer sellers. Uh, one is to get to the closing table. Um, so you get people to go to the closing tables, a lot of work uh, behind the seat and get people to go to the closing table. So after you close, now is to get paid, right? For the yeah. professionals to get paid, uh, for the new homeowner to get the key and so forth. And so many reasons where closing schedule keep on getting pushed up to the four o'clock deadline. And then when you, uh, after you close, then the attorney or the paralegal would have to run to the register to, to record in person. So now everything uh, is, is online. But even with everything's online, there's some more customer service 
areas that are in needed that mm -hmm. we still can provide, that we can expand. Uh, for example, you know, there's always going to be some law offices that are going to be at 4 o'clock, yeah. not able to do it online exactly at 4 or 4.30. Um, we can expand the, the hours a little bit to accommodate uh, people who are closing so tight. Yeah. Um, just because it's so important. What, what is the, uh, an extra five minutes, an extra 30 minutes um, to get them? Because there's so much anxiety, the transaction uh, process, to get to the closing, um, to get the keys to the new house and, um, and so forth. Another thing that we can do is to bring the services, the education uh, to, to the towns themselves to provide education. And just as much as people can have an idea what the registry is, like you mentioned, to record, um, to provide information and so forth, not a lot of people utilize uh, the, the resource. So owning a home is, for many people, it's the biggest asset that, that they have. And they can do a lot to protect the asset. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about fraud earlier, but one of the things they can protect themselves is to sign uh, for an email called the Consumer Notification System. Mm -hmm. um, simply put, if somebody were to record a deed that includes your property and your name, if you sign up for the CNS, Consumer Notification System, you would get an, uh, an email, an alert, uh, that something's being done under your name or under your property most of the times, it might not be you because there's so many names, you know, like, uh, I'm, I can't make up all the other American names, yeah. but there's so variations of um, John and Jack, right? Yeah, right. So, well, I, I, know, <laughs> I know of five Philip Tebos, so Philip I, I understand Tebow, what you're uh, saying. There, there you go. <laughs> but at least you are aware of what's going on. If, if one out of uh, 200 emails that come to your email um, that doesn't pertain to you and one, uh, one does, it's good to catch catch it early on in, in, a, in a space, so that way you can do something about it. <coughs> uh, instead of let it go for a couple of years, somebody might try to refinance your property under your name, basically owning your property, and then you'll be responsible for paying the, the mortgage, which you don't, don't know about. Um, you know, reading those email once in a while, it, it, it's very, very helpful. Um, so many things that the register can do just to improve the register, to expand the services. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, one of the things that we can do is education, not just in terms of using CNS, but also like when I grew up, we did not know a pathway to owning a home. How about providing financial literacy at the high school level? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe the local colleges like Middlesex Community College um, to provide, say, you know, this is what you do. Learn how to budget, learn how to save. Yeah, learn um, how to do a checkbook, which nobody yeah. does today. Uh, uh, absolutely. So yeah. that's what gives you a pathway to owning a home. Right. And, and uh, you know, when you, I can't say enough how important it is to own your own home right. and to protect the home <coughs> one, once you own it. And the financial literacy aspect of it would be very, very vital. F you had a question, Gordy. Yeah, so yeah. what do you think, you, I think you touched on a little bit about the technology, but what do you think the biggest budget issue is going to be for the registry? And would you support like an increase in fees for registering a home? Well, um, I'm always going to be for efficiency. Um, so in the past uh, a few years, we did increase the, the fee, but that was to include the, uh, the CPP, the Conservation okay. Fund for Open Space. And I think that, that, that that's needed, you know, because we provide open space for um, uh, historical homes and things like that. Um, you know, we have so many uh, enriched public space, uh, rich culture, rich history. And with the growing population, as you know, and there's always there's going to be like an, uh, a demand on developing, on using different space for this, for that. So I, I think it's important to have that type of fee, to have that type of fund available uh, for municipality to figure out what they want to do with, with this space, with the time to do with this space. Um, I think we need to expand, we need to get more funding uh, from the state, from the federal. The way I look at it, there's all kinds of fundings out there. And if you don't apply for it, if we don't get it, it's going to go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with getting more funding to our registry to provide the service. And if we can do it, even like increase the staff, because I think the staff right now, um, they're very efficient, but I think they might be overworked as, mm -hmm. um, a, a, as well, <coughs> right? So um, with more staff and more human resource, we can expand the services, uh, make it more personal for each town. So the registry of deed is located inside Lowell, but it serves uh, 10 communities all together, all the way to Carlisle, to uh, Dunstable, to uh, Wilmington. Uh, we need to make the registry belongs to everybody, belongs to all the 10 communities. 
And I don't think we can, we can do it without expanding it for the next few years. Well, Sakawi, we, believe it or not, 30 minutes has just flown by. <laughs> right? and, and, and obviously you, yeah. uh, you are very well versed in what you, your vision is and where you want to go with this. Um, we'd like to have you come back again because, I mean, you've got time before the September primary. Is it September primary? Sep September 3rd. So primary. maybe over the summer we'll have you come back in and we'll talk some more, right? It, but in honor. the meantime, why don't you take a look right into that camera and, and ask the voters of Drake it for your vote. Uh, thank you. Again, my name is Sakari Chow. I am a candidate for the registered med Middlesex North. I will work hard for you. I will make sure that customer service is our top priority. Make sure we provide excellence, transparency, and honesty. Um, I kindly, I humbly ask for your vote on September 3rd primary. Thank you. Well, thank you again for, for joining us tonight, uh, today, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about getting you back on sometime in thank the next you, few you. months. So in the much. meantime, ladies and gentlemen, while we, while we switch out here and get our next candidate in to talk, um, we've got a small, short video that we wanted to just show you a little bit of a perspective of someone in Drakeit who has been saying what great things have been going on and how now, and that was just a year ago in April, and now we've got uh, issues. We'll listen so slowly to this. It's uh, Brian Genest, who is uh, the uh, husband of the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, who just got reelected, and we'll get more into that when we come back. So listen to this for a minute, and then we'll come back. Thanks again, Sir Cowley. Thank you, John. Appreciate and it. the challenges. Thanks to her leadership, Drake is in better shape than it has been in quite some time. Town finances are in solid shape. School spending is on the rise. Capital improvement projects are being worked on all over town. We're trying to balance growth and development with open space, preservation, and conservation. There's a strong focus on economic development, including bringing in new businesses and supporting existing ones. Morale at Town Hall is high. People in town are optimistic about our future. Unfortunately, there's a small group of negative voices in town who do nothing but try to tear down our success. On the airway... Hey, we're back. And uh, we're, we're happy to um, have had Sakawi Chow come in, and uh, we will have the other two candidates hopefully in in the next few weeks um, to come and talk to about their candidacies also. We reached out to Joe Reddy, who's a candidate, and Karen Casella. We have heard back from Joe, and we're talking about some dates, and possibly the next uh, Saturday we'll have him in and talk stuff again about the Registry of Deeds, but we want to thank him for taking the time to come in. But right now, you just listened to a short piece uh, that Brian Genest, who's the number one negative person in town and points the finger to everybody else being negative. He's a basher of any political person who's not his wife or the big three in, in Drake it, uh, talking about Jennifer Kopsinski and Joe DiRocco, who's the outgoing guy. And we have uh, a couple of candidates that are uh, running for selectmen in the seat for, to fill the seat that's being vacated by Joe DiRocco, thank goodness. And uh, at this point, um, anybody is going to be better than Joe as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and the bottom line is that we have the candidates. We have at least two are going to be lined up to come in. <coughs> and uh, right now we have uh, Josh Taylor with us today. Hi, Josh. Hey, John. Thank you for having me. Good Phil, good Gordy, you. nice to see you all. Welcome. Yeah. Now, you've been a candidate before yep. um, for Drake It. So I ran in 2022. Drake It politics, right? Yep, not a stranger to it. Yeah. So why don't you tell us, uh, tell the people, just to remind them who Josh Taylor is and what you do currently. Well, I'm Josh Taylor. I am uh, obviously candidate for Drake at Selectman this term. I am a uh, local guy. I've been in Drake at 42 years, uh, born and raised. My wife's a special educator up in Nashua. Uh, I'm the only candidate that's got a son that's enrolled in the Drake at school system. And uh, I'm a business owner. I own an uh, investment company. We buy and sell real estate. I own a construction company. We're uh, busy doing quite a few projects up in New Hampshire. Actually, Phil just uh, finished a set of plans for me for a house we're building up in Londonderry. Um, looking to get onto the Board of Selectmen to help get some better transparency in town, 
help with communication and try to apply my problem solving skills to looking into the budget. Oh, good. So your professional experience um, <coughs> involving with construction gives you a unique um, perspective towards zoning and all of that stuff as well as management in itself, right? By well, we, we do have a perspective into it and obviously the management of managing a company, I mean, uh, I also, uh, past five years, I worked for one of my opponents. I managed his company for him and was his foreman and, and did every other day-to-day -day activities for him. Mm. So it's uh, no, no real difference. Um, you know, we have to look at the problems that we have as a business perspective and try to find solutions for them, break them down into small manageable pieces and, and attack each piece to find a solution. Uh, Gordy? Yes, yeah, so Josh, I don't know if you were able to watch the finance uh, special meeting the finance committee had last, a few days ago. Few days ago yeah. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to get your take on, you know, Ann is doing a lot of cuts around town, uh, you know, for each, all the departments, they're cutting overtime, et cetera. Um, where do you think we can get more income coming in and how do we, how do we resolve the big budget crisis that we're in right now with the town? Well, it's going to be a work in progress. I mean, I do have some ideas. We really need to look at, you know, the economic development is we aren't really going after and trying to attract the big business. We, I don't see it actively on my end anyways. Uh, we have to look at the TIFs they're giving away, right? We just gave away $135,000 tax incentive financing for an already established business in town. Now, I don't have any problem that that business got it, but that procedure should be looked at differently. That should have been applied for and voted on before they already built the building in town, well, not after. Isn't that a fact? It's, it's, I'm glad you jumped right into the TIF stuff because that's a question we have. Yeah. But isn't it a fact that he's a, he, that's a business that's already in the ground, that's been here historically, <coughs> the guy's a millionaire, and not that that shouldn't make him eligible for any other tax incentives, but shouldn't that have been done before he got in the ground? Well, that's my point, that all that should be negotiated ahead of time and transparent to the people in town right. and decided so that he knows before he invests millions in a new building if he's going to qualify for the financing or not. Yeah. But it's, it was done kind of pushed through it at a selectman's meeting after the fact, and I just don't think that the way it was done is appropriate. So that's one thing that we can look at. You know, if we're in a deficit year and, and we're looking to charge homeowners $300 a piece for a trash fee, but we're giving away $135,000 to a, a business who's getting rental income and, you know, commercial income. That doesn't make sense. You know, we're taking from the poor to give to the rich, and that's big space. Uh, exactly. Yeah. When you're when you, so. you're facing a three million dollar budget deficit here in the first year, and then you're giving this guy a, a hundred and thirty. And let's let's not for, for net, forget the connection of the business owner. And and I like Eddie Ayer, <coughs> but the business owner and Joe DiRocco are like best friends. No, I, mean, I, I get what you're saying. I'm not looking at a personal connection. To me, it's, it's down to the business point of it. I take the, the people out of the equation. I look at the, the economics of the decision. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't feel that that was the right decision at the right time. Yep. You know, the other thing we have to really look at is, is the split tax rate for business. You know, the communities around us are all charging businesses double what residents pay. And here we are. They pay the same rate. You mm -hmm. know, I have commercial space in town. I own a business in town. You know, I don't really want to pay more, but businesses make money. They should be able to absorb a little bit more. Uh, Will it solve our problem? No, it won't. <clears throat> Will it help? It'll help. But the boards aren't communicating together. Nobody's talking about those issues. Um, they, they want to push an override, but they're not talking about solutions to the problem. An override's and a Band-Aid. I noticed that wasn't one of the solutions that Ann had put up on the screen. What's and that? Victor is, is splitting that. No. Well, the tax you know, rate. Phil can, can address this, too, a lot better than I can, I think, but, I, but I'm familiar with it myself because in order to get a split tax for businesses, you have to have a certain amount of businesses in town before they have to be more than 20, 25 percent of your overall tax. Am I correct? Be, before, <clears throat> I think before it truly becomes effective. So you're dealing with your, your uh, levy ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so that really doesn't change. And then when you, when you do a split tax rate, you're still not changing the levy ceiling. Right. <clears throat> so to, to, it, it would, it, our, it, for Drake it right now, it would have minimal impact, I think, on the residential. So you could double, right. double or triple or quadruple the tax rate for businesses. And, and I think the average household will probably only see a 
$50 reduction at the end of the year. Right, right. And, and, and it really doesn't add to it if you haven't expanded your economic development base, your business base. And that's why when I was on the board 17, uh, 15 years ago, or whatever it was, I served for nine years, one of the things I proposed was the Economic Development Committee. And that committee was formulated to go out and attract big business that's going to make an instant impact, not small impacts like, uh, like the impact on uh, you know, what a nail salon has or a coffee shop brings in in revenue. I mean, you look at the budget book, and we have one here, and we've been looking at it. I mean, the expanded revenue, new revenue over the last course of the last year was $450,000. You're never going to keep up with the pace of inflation with that kind of revenue, uh, expanded revenue. And you can't always go back to the taxpayer for it. Having said that, um, the idea of a split tax is a good thing, but you need to start at the basic. You need to get more business in here before you do that. Um, how do you feel about an override? Um, <clears throat> I don't like the idea of it personally. It's a Band-Aid. It's not right. a solution. Would, would you, you know, support an override? To the extent of voting in favor of it to put it to town meeting so that the residents can vote for it. In the current state that we're in right now, I wouldn't personally support it until we've worked through the steps to try to find solutions. So, so right, right now, it's, again, it's a, it's a three-year Band-Aid. Okay. It's so you're, in, you're not in favor of an override per se. So as a voter and as a taxpayer, would you vote for an override? In the current situation we're in right now, if all we're doing is an override, no, I would not. Okay, so, but you would vote to advance it to town meeting to allow the town meeting to ask for it to be on the ballot so that the voters can take. That is correct. So and, my and job, if, if elected as selectman, is to take the Warren articles that are put in front of me and vote to approve them to go to town meeting. Right. It's so there are two different types of overrides, right? There's an override for um, debt exclusion, which is usually for building something or purchasing something that's a one-time purchase. We'll be purchase. facing one of those shortly for the Campbell School Project. We're going to face that. And, and they criticized me for, making, for saying that it was a $100 million project coming down the pipeline. And they said, well, it isn't even in, it, we don't even know. But $100 million is probably low, right, Phil? So the, uh, I know the town just put out an RFQ for designers, and they, yeah. they put the budget at $99 million to $144 million. <laughs> I guess you weren't too far off, John. <laughs> I wasn't far <laughs> off, but I wasn't, I wasn't wrong. I wasn't, uh, you know, you can't be talking about an override for operating expenses that's going to the tune of $10 million over the course of three years. I don't care how long it takes, but you, you can't talk about a $10 million override and an, an eight to a $1,100 tax uh, increase upon the property owners in town and then think for one minute that they're not going to put the two together, that you're, look, you're also looking for $100 million for schools. Both of those projects, both of those ideas are going to go down the tubes, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, I'm not voting for either one of them, because you're asking me for an $1,100 and then another eight dollars or $900 over, over the lifetime of my, my living here for a new school. That's just not going to happen in the, in the, in the taxpayer's mind. Um, so, you know, there's people out there that say that um, this has been a problem for a long time. It's been coming. So why did we have politicians last election, and you were a candidate last election. Not last, the one prior oh, to Oh, one before. Was. Okay, so the one prior to that. In the last election, the chair of the board, Allison Janess, was running for re-election, and she had all kinds of paraphernalia and videos out there saying how fiscally sound the town was. And then late May, after the election, the roof caved in. I think the slogan was "Keep the momentum going." Yeah, and, and it was. We, and we, was we, <laughs> we, we landed with that. That was the subject of the video we showed earlier, which we're going to get into more when you're not here. But they were. They tell people that you're corrupt and you're and you're thinking. And, and I mean, there's there's a hit piece out on you. I think you saw it. Oh, I saw it. In, in, in the I laughed at from it. It was comical. On Drake, it, which is. To me, it, this, this guy is the most negative person in the town. His wife is the chairman of the Board of Selectmen. She tries to stay above it, but they're connected at the hips. Of course they are. And they, and they don't, and, I, and, and 
I mean, for her to say in all of her pieces last April that everything was hunky-dory here in Drakeit, and then the manager comes out with a $3 million deficit and a deficit four or five years down the line. I mean, how can you tell me that I should believe anything you write? Uh, he, he hit you pr pretty hard here yep. uh, on saying that you, um, you talked, that you talked about, um, you know, that he, he writes that Josh Taylor is so desperate to get any attention from the voters, right, that he, he accused town officials, uh, the town of fiscal mismanagement during an appearance on another yep. phony uh, And I'll stand talk by show. my statement. Uh, yeah. So what, what do you believe is fiscal mismanagement? Well, you have uh, projects that can be condoned as emergency repairs that aren't necessarily emergency repairs that get handed out to chosen contractors. That's really? one. Okay. Um, you know, anybody can look into it. It's pretty easy. Yeah. You know, there, there's things that happen in town that can wait, that can go out to bid properly that don't happen. Right. So, you know, mismanagement doesn't mean that they're stealing or hiding. I never, never said that. No. They, they interpreted it how they wanted to, to take their own shot. Well, guilt, guilt kind of gets in the so, way sometimes. <laughs> you know, there's, there's plenty of things. You know, we have instances where volunteers can volunteer at Beaver, Beaverbrook Farm to shore up a, uh, a building so we don't have to pay 250 grand. And we said we can't, but then when it's time to put a roof on another building there, certain chosen individuals get the green light to go ahead and do it they can volunteer. So how, how is it good for one, but not for another? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same battles. I mean, that's part of the, the, uh, the hardships with working with the ad hoc committee. It was it's everything I brought up as far as insurance or whatever was always met with nothing but dead resistance. But when other people bring stuff up, oh, it's great. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Let's do it. Mm. So it's, it's the Shall same we? old, uh, you know, good for you attitude that we have in town. We, got, we have a comment, Josh. You might like to hear this one. Oh, sure. Uh, it's from Patsky Rose. This guy has my vote for the simple fact that he knows his job is to bring issues to the people to vote on, not his job to make the decisions. That's correct. Based on that alone, he has my vote. You well, gained a vote? I appreciate that very much. Today, huh? No, I appreciate it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I want to be reachable to people. Right. I want the people to communicate with me. You can put my phone number right up there on the screen in big numbers. Sure. You know, sure. give me a call. Sure. Somebody has a question or a comment, you know, if I'm elected, that, that stays the same. My shop's got an open door. So I'm there, happy to there, talk. There's, there's the cabal in town is trying to connect you to two other selectmen saying that you're their chosen candidate. Hmm. When, when, to my knowledge, I don't think you've been endorsed by any, any I, I, current. I haven't been endorsed by anybody currently. You know, if they chose to endorse me, it's for what I have to say during the election, you know. You say chosen, that's, that's funny. So nobody has pushed me to run. Nobody's asked me to run. I'm doing it on my own because I see a problem. <clears throat> and I think we can, you know, bring some, some insight and try to help the community move forward. My well, whole existence. To, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. my whole existence as far as doing stuff in the town has been focused on helping the community. So I'm doing it on my own behalf for the residents, for the people of Drake to try to help get through these problems. That's why I'm doing it. You don't volunteer to do this. Right. Unless you, you have a, a true cause. Yeah. Other, you know, opponents are being put up by former selectmen or, you know, the cabal, as you call them in town. And, you know, they're being put up to run. That's the difference between me and my opponents. I'm doing it because I want to, because I want to help the town. I'm not doing it because somebody asked me to do right. it. Right. So you're, you're one of your big nemesis now. We mentioned him earlier is Janest, and he's obviously... Oh, he, does, he doesn't bother me, John. It, it, yeah, but, but you, you need to talk about what he's saying so that if you don't, remember that it becomes reality if somebody doesn't, yeah. if you don't answer this stuff. Re if you don't so refute what they're If you don't saying. refute what they're saying, I mean, yeah. and he says, this is the guy who And he wants tells to, everyone else lies and he, he, he wants writes to, the lie. He wants to be the truth sayer. You yeah. see, everything that comes out of his mouth is true, according to him and his wife, because she backs everything he does. So according to this piece that Mr. Janest put out, um, we're, we're fam we know him for famously hitting Phil and hitting me and hitting everybody else that's a, that has a different idea from him and his wife we're, and the th big three. We're all in the but same club now. But he says that you, will, you plan to form an, a, an alliance with Tony Oczynski and Heather Santiago, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to exact revenge on the manager. Right? You, want, you want me to hit a, you want me to answer that one yeah, for you? Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to. Sure. I'm not going to form an alliance with anybody. I'm independent. I'm going to go and I'm going to say what's right. I'm going to say what I think the people need to hear, 
right? It's if Tony and Heather and I agree on something, great. I may agree with Allison and Jen on something and not Tony and Heather. Right. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak my piece on what it is. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to try to hold everybody on the board liable to answer questions. You know, when I was chair of Conservation Commission, I would go around and I would say, I would call out the members on the board and say, what do you, how do you think about this? Instead of, you open up a discussion and you sit there and everybody's just like this, yeah. looking down at their phone. Nobody's asking questions. You point them out on it. You call them That's out on it. That's what you're there for. Yeah. Out of, out, of, out of debate and talk about issues, talking about issues comes good decisions. Well, usually. You know, usually it, it, it'd unless be you're nice, already set. It would be nice if sitting selectmen endorsed you. I understand that. I'm not going to beg them to. No. If they do, it's on their own behalf because they like what I have to say and they think I would be a good choice for the job. Now, if they do it on that premises, it's great. Now the, we'll, we'll take this, endorsements from anybody. This guy goes on to say that after all, it was Heather Santiago Hutchins who coached Josh Taylor, uh, or, or coaxed Josh Taylor into running uh, against her buddy, Warren Shaw's chosen candidate. Could, uh, here we go again with Don Plummer. Because a guy wants to run, it, they got to tell you, you know why they say this stuff, Josh? Because that's what they do. Well, projection. That's what they do. Projection. They can't, so they, they, don't, they don't have anything nice or intelligent to say about their candidate. So their only attack right. is to pick <clears> on <throat> myself or Phil when it was his turn or anybody else that's running against the And then they blame it on us that of we're doing they it. Do. Right. And it's, I it's, only point out what they are doing. Yeah. I have no gain in this. None. I don't have a gain. What yeah. do I have? I, I, I don't gain anything personally out of this or anything, except my ego gets boosted up, which we know <laughs> I have a big ego. That's okay. And that's fine. I admit it. But they don't want a guy like Phil who thinks differently than them. They don't want anybody that thinks differently. They don't want a guy like Gordy coaching the, the JV basketball team in Drake it because he sits on a show where we talk about issues and we give opinions. They certainly don't want me on any boards because I had a fight to get on the, the last boards I was yeah. on because I'll bring a different perspective. And maybe something they, will they come don't up want with. a different perspective. They don't no. want a problem solver. They don't want somebody that thinks and questions their authority or asks questions. Right. They want compliance. They want that's a, what they want. Someone to go along, they get along to go along. That's so. what they want, and that's not me. It doesn't matter if it's on one side or the other side of the table. It doesn't matter where I sit that's up. It's best there. for the town. That's I'm independent, want. and I'm there for the people of the town. So and that's you touched it. on economic development. I want to get back to that for a minute because we have a few minutes left before we have to let you go and um, move on. I mean, we, you can stay as long as you want, but we're going to get into no, other, other I, issues. I understand. But um, um, one of the issues, when I proposed the Economic Development Committee, and we had that committee going, it was supposed to be to push the manager and town manager mint into developing a future plan to entice big business to come in that's going to have a big impact on future revenues, future re tax revenues. And my vision was at the time to try to get some kind of a big box, um, you know, effort in here. And at the time I wasn't as in tune with the internet as I am today, but even today you could have a proposal out there for a digital uh, storage uh, facility here in Drake, which doesn't take any services away from the town, doesn't add to schools, doesn't add to anything that's significant, but would, because by virtue of it being a hundred million dollar project, giving you millions of dollars in new tax revenue, and the economic spillover of bringing people <coughs> in to, to buy things in Drake, it, to spend their money in Drake. It. But nobody thinks that way. They think ribbon cutting for a coffee uh, shop, for a coffee shop, or for a uh, a copy or uh, you know a, a printing shop or a or a nail salon is what economic development is all about. That's ridiculous. They're not doing a thing to expand the uh, the revenue. Nothing. I mean, how about looking at the two major highways or mo major roads that come into Drake at um, one thirteen and, and uh, one ten, and seeking state aid to expand and widen those roads so that we can get more business in here. You can keep the rural aspect of Drake it you can. and hide big business like you, this. You can put big business like that in places just like on Commercial Drive up behind Dunkin' Donuts on, right. on uh, 113. There's plenty of business down in the back there. You know, avenues like that, you don't have to take a big business and put it right on a main road to be successful to, no, yeah. to bring in revenue. We get criticized for, for making um, light of the economic developer planner. 
Now, I, you know, he's a great guy. I know him as, a, as an individual. He's a great guy, great writer. He wrote for the Lowell Sun for many years, and I'm sure he did hit pieces on people too. But the bottom line is, he's nothing more than an advertising agency. That's it. He's just promoting the current business, which is a good thing, yep. but you're not expanding the, the, the Drakeit revenue sources that we need to, to sustain these kinds of issues. So, I mean, you want to try to put the, pull the wool over people's eyes, that's a good way of doing it. And they, they've, done a, they've been very successful at, at saying, oh, here's economic development, economic development. Every single store that I've seen, or close to every single store that we've seen that had a ribbon cutting, has already changed hands one or two times. Am I right, Phil? Quite a few of them. Quite a few of them. Uh, Don Tito's is, a, is, is an example of it. You're not going to sustain that kind of business. It's tough being in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. I know I was there. It's tough running a nail salon. And you're not gaining significant tax revenue right. to get to a split, split tax fee. Yeah. You had something to say? Right. You're exactly right. We need a big business like in, um, Mr. Chow that was on previously talked about. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest thing that's happening now? It's AI. Right. If you don't think that's the case, I don't care, nothing, nothing, that train has left the station, nothing's stopping it. Right. It's going 180 miles an hour and there's nothing getting in its way. So what we have to do right now is we have to start, we have to get ahead of the situation and get, let's get a data center in the Drake it. Right. Well, there's no, pe there's a, few, what I just pe said. Yeah. a few people that work here. Right. Right, but you're bringing in millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And there's companies right now looking dying for places what to What would be wrong with an Amazon set. warehouse hidden in the background, say on Vinyl's property? Not even that, not even that. Well, you, then you got, you, the trucks, you got the trucks coming in and out, where if you have a data center, there's no traffic right. coming in. It's but, all but, electronic but with data the trucks going over a wire. And out, with the truck, we have trucking in Drake. You know that, oh, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have yeah. Old Dominion. You have a whole bunch of different truck trucking yep. outfits that you don't even know are here, yeah. right? Well, so the rate right on the town aspect. line with Drake and Methuen, right on the main roads. So that's... Right. So it's, let's talk you, a little bit. You're not bit bringing well, big <laughs> business into so. the center of town, and you're not impacting traffic in the center of town. Right. If you put something out on the outskirts, uh, and it's that would be. Go talk to Markley, who's in Lowell, that runs a data center. Say, hey, we want, can you expand your data center over to Drake it? Here's a spot we have for you. So I might agree with a TIF if we can get a $100 million uh, right. business right. in town, because that's the intent of it, as far right. as right. my understanding. Well, what yeah. about what Lowell's doing with their link project with the college? Yeah. We're right on the line. Right. The college is right there. Why hasn't anybody uh, approached Marty, me, and, and that group to expand into Drake it in the in the Navy Yard area, where Phil is always touting needs help? Yeah. Go ahead, Phil. Um, I don't know if you've been following all of the, the uh, zoning bylaw review and, and the updates and stuff. Um, it seems that <clears throat> some some of the members who have been put onto that are, are steadfast in saying. They don't want to, how to change the look of Drake it. And my big question to them is always, what the hell does Drake it look like? Because <laughs> I can show you a number of different pictures. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to have a segment one of these days with pictures. And I'm, the, the choice is going to be Drake it or not Drake it. But anyway, yeah. any, so do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, if you're looking for economic development, I think zoning bylaw changes is really where it needs to start. Well, I know somebody that tried to get on that committee with a good vision, but was blocked from getting on it. <laughs> yeah, because so, he doesn't think like Guilty is charged. They don't want, well, they don't want I mean, somebody that can't put let's, the let's take somebody that's highly qualified. That's, you know, the, the issues that we run into with the, the stuff in town here. Is you take somebody that's highly qualified who's dedicated his life to, to architecture and, and buildings and designs and, and knows the zoning laws, but because of who you are, they just don't want you to help. It just doesn't make sense. Where do you stand on the Murphy Farm issue? Where do I stand on it? We, yeah. can't, we can't sustain it. I don't think it should go through at all. We don't have the infrastructure. We can't handle, we can't handle our own finances right now <laughs> with a deficit, and we want to add in you know, hundreds of, of four-bedroom apartments for school, for fire, for police, roads for DPW to plow. It's, that, that's going to take our deficit and double it. There's nothing there. The tax revenue from that property is not going to help us right. at all. What do you, you know, what do I you got up at the, at the zoning meeting, which was, was quite funny, uh, in my eyes anyways, is you know, they have an attorney that prepared a letter. I don't know if any of you guys saw that meeting. They had an attorney that prepared a letter that had to address the issues at Murphy's Farm, and they entered it into the, into the board. They mailed it in ahead of time. The board's all sitting there talking about this letter. And um, 
they don't want to they don't want to read the content of the letter well one of the members gets up and asks if she can read the content of the letter and she's shot down oh we'll post it on the town website and I'm sitting in a, in a room and I'm watching this and it's funny my two opponents are sitting in the room watching the same thing and I got up and I to the podium and I spoke about it, it says out of transparency I said you're the chair of, of the meeting you can read the letter so that everybody knows what you're talking about you don't have to acknowledge you don't have to answer questions you don't have to have any discussion on it but you could read the letter so that the people that are watching, the people that are in the room, know what this topic yeah, is. If, if you're going to post it on the website on Monday, what's the difference if you read right. it today? And, you know, the, the entire card group was, you know, they were clapping in the background as I said that. But, you know, why do we block things like that in town? Mm -hmm. Well, so. you've got a manager who's trying to, um, to, to help in some way, I believe, the Murphy Farm issue well. get in the ground. It's, I think that's possible. She sees she sees revenue, and she doesn't care what kind of revenue it is. She was she you you heard her early on saying <coughs> that you know we have to try to work with this yeah. developer to get the right stuff in there. And, but that's not good for the neighborhood, right? It's, it's not. It's, good it's, for the it's neighborhood. not. We don't. We can't sustain it. It's not good for the neighborhood. And you know the other point in my discussion, my my opponents were in the same meeting that I was, but they don't get up and speak about it. They post on Facebook the next day that they should have read the. <laughs> so one of your opponents recently said on another show and um, that, you know, if he's elected, he thinks that Ann Vandal's doing a good job. Yeah, I saw and that. And that Ann Vandal uh, should get a new contract. Yeah. And um, so let's say that they that Ann Vandal didn't leave after after the election and you got elected. What, what would you do? I mean, what would you think should happen now? Well, I mean, I'm not going to do anything about Ann Vandal, you know, as far as that. I'm not looking to fire Ann Vandal. I'm not looking to replace her, per se. You know, when it comes up for time for contract renewal, I think we should look at the options of getting a better suitable candidate, somebody that's got more talent that can help us get out of the rut. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be shy about saying that. Um, you know, people think that I have a vendetta that I just want to get rid of her. It's not the case at all. Well, that's what they try to do. Well, that's what they try to spin off, but... You know, so, so let me ask you this. Let's say Ann Vandal retires yep. and there's a new process. Did you like the process that went to get Ann Vandal in here? Well, I didn't hate the process. The outcome didn't follow the process. That was a problem. Good, good answer. So the, 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 good process, answer. The, the process was, was put in place to do the right job, to find the best talent that we could find to bring Drake it forward. Josh, that's a great answer. You know, so we have the process. But then but when, we decide, the when we decide to take the process and rip it up and all the effort of everybody and throw it out and then just go hire who we want, why have the process? So one of your opponents already has a candidate, apparently, because they yeah. say uh, we shouldn't go outside to look. We already, I think we have talent within, within uh, town. Well, that, that may be... It may be true. That may be his opinion, but, you know, we should see what the townspeople think of that also. Yeah. I guess we will on the 4th. What do you think about the charter? I'm going to go from. I'm going to give you some. You're going to, going to go right, right to the charter. I, yes. I think you know the first <coughs> meeting when they decided to elect the committee was the right thing to do. But Correct. when they come back after the fact and decide that uh, they made a mistake and now they want to hand it off to town management, you have town management writing the charter for the town. It just doesn't make any sense so, to me. So isn't the charter much like the Constitution of the United States? It's the people's document. Should be. So if the people who are formulating what should be changed in the charter, a handpicked by the management of the town and, and the big three of the Board of Selectmen. Um, do you think anything's going to change? No, not at all. I like your, your uh, slogan, so, by the way. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Right. And, and the bottom <laughs> line is they're, gonna, they're not going to change anything Correct. that's significant that needs to be changed to bring us into the 21st century. What's well, you well, well the, I mean, Ann has already said, I don't see anything that needs to be changed. Right. So, exactly. Which is unfortunate because I could probably rattle off half a dozen things off the top of my head. So um, you would be in favor of a process that involves the people to... 100%. To, um, the people should be involved in all of those decisions based on, on that topic. 
Uh, do we have any other questions? I have a million things I could ask this Keep guy, going. but we only gave. <laughs> we, 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 we only have a little bit of time because I have a million things I could <laughs> say. So, <laughs> yeah. can can we do another show? Yes. And do like a whole hour or something. Yes. I'm sure we can fill it in. De definitely. Let's. We we often call my people. We've often <laughs> yeah. We've <laughs> often um, all of the candidates to come in. Don Plum is coming in next week, and we hope to have a spirited. Uh, discussion with him yeah. too and I think that you know he's another candidate that's going to be looking outside of the box I believe and we'll see where he what he says uh, and for the record for the record I don't think anybody here has endorsed you as a, or this show has not endorsed no. you as a candidate so I want that on the record that you're not John Zimini's candidate because not that's all. the next thing they're going to tell you because no. you're here on the show. And I'll say the same thing to Don Plummer, and if Dave Martin comes in, he choose, he's been offered the position to come in, and if he wants fluff, go to the other show. If you wanna come in here and really have a discussion, come and talk to us and we'll, we'll talk about where yeah. he stands on the issues. You, know, well. you mentioned endorsements. You know, I have the Drake at Police Association endorsement, which is the, uh, the boots on the ground, men and women of the force, the people that the community sees outside interacting every day, so I'm very proud of that endorsement. <clears throat> Great group of people. And, and did you get another endorsement? I, I have, well, I've got uh, New England Police Benevolent Association who is going to uh, help us out with some mailers and, and uh, stuff like that, which is a piece that came off of the Drake Police Association. Right. Well, we'd love to have you come back in because I'd love to talk more about um, how you are pretty much self-funding self your campaign, which you get knocked for because you're not asking people to yeah. commit to you that we, you we might did have take, to be We did take to. in a small amount of donations. I say small amount, you know, you roughly $1,000 came in, which I appreciate, but I'm not actively seeking donations. Correct. It's, you know, I'm self-funded. Again, I have, I, have, I have businesses in town. You know, when I worked for my previous employer, that paycheck just went into a savings account. I didn't, you know, right. I've been doing this my whole life. You know, I get digged on for buying vehicles. They're investments. I don't buy something unless I can sell it for a profit. That's, you know, and those are the, the, that's the type of leadership, that's the values I teach my son, you know, he's at the shop. We just bought all new sign equipment at the shop, spent over $30,000 on printers to put in my new office so we could wrap our own trucks, make our own signs. And, you know, I'm, I'm teaching him those values so he can take that now and go out and do something with it. Well, when I'm done, we can sell them. It's you know, that, that simple. That, that's a, 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 a mind thought that often gets overlooked these days that um, it's that's truly thinking out of the box Correct. when you look at today's sort of sure. thinking well thank you Josh for coming in not a problem anytime would like you would like to have you come back uh, like I said we have Don Plummer next week and the following week we'll if Dave doesn't want to come on we'll have you well, or Don come back and but before talk. you kick me off I'm gonna look at the you, screen that's what All I'm right. gonna tell you to do <laughs> look at Good. that look at that Good. camera and Tell the so, people what you want. No, I just wanted to say I'm Josh Taylor, candidate for Drake at Selectman. You can give me a call if you want, 978-631-9936 is my cell phone. You know, I'm happy to talk to anybody. I'm happy to meet anybody for a coffee, drink, lunch, discuss the town. Uh, I'm, I am hopeful that we can connect and I can earn your vote, and I respectfully ask you to vote for me on May 4th. 30 days, uh, actually four weeks from today yeah. is the election, so... Um, Get out there, people, and know who the candidates are. Josh, thanks again Not a for problem. coming in. We'll, Thank you. Uh, we'll be in touch to have you back. Appreciate on. it. All right? And you can just take off that mic and walk out, and All we're right. going to continue because we don't have anything to fill in. We didn't All prepare right. for that. <laughs> so I do have a commercial. Oh, we have a commercial. Okay, oh, he's going to show this. I'm already done. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Just don't All say right. anything because the mics are on. Go. Break it, Mass. That's beautiful. Awesome. That's Drake it? Yep. Oh yeah. There's the is gazebo. Oh good. All right, so we're back. So we're back here. Guys, that what a great two hits today on on well, on, yeah. on our uh, yep. interviews with the candidates. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in town as we already did, right? And I I'd, I'd like to open it up with saying how everything was so rosy last April. Everything was so rosy. The candidate for re-election was uh, um, Janest, and her husband, who is, who's, is like her campaign manager, got on, <coughs> got on uh, you know, cable and got on in different venues and said about how, how fiscally sound everything is in Drake it. 
Keep and the then, momentum going. Keep the I momentum believe. going, right? right? And then, but he wants you to be, to believe that his wife and he are going to be honest with the people of Drake, it, right? So let's talk about that for a minute. Where did you, what did you think really happened on that during that election? Did you run last time? No, no, no. no. Okay. I. Uh, I, I may have got it out of my system. Who knows? I mean, I, it could be cured. <laughs> it could be cured, maybe, yeah. Yeah, how about you? What did you think of all of that? Well, obviously something's changed, right? And, you know, it, when you look at the, bu the budget crisis we're facing, there's really two huge things that come in, right? It's the, the tax money, the property taxes, and state funding. So what's been happening is the... If you look, if you go back in history and look, is that property tax is pretty, pretty much stayed flat, which means what? We're not building new houses. We're not expanding our, increasing the property. The tax in our, base, right. right. So that's what we have to do. It's pretty obvious. And I did, I actually did some research. And did you know the average house now in Drake is 553,000? That's the wow. value of the average house now. Yeah. Um, but what I did notice, and I brought this up on previous shows, is we have a lot of, um, properties in the town that are multi, mu you know, have multi acreage. Hmm. And if you look at the tax base <clears throat> that those people are paying, it's peanuts compared to whatever one else is paying. Right. Um, for example, I don't want to pick on anyone, but for example, Brock's Farm. Yeah. Right? Brock's Farm is 12 acres worth of land and they've got a business on there, they've got a home on there. They're paying $600,000 on property taxes for that. I don't want to pick on them. No. But I'm just saying that's an example. We have 14, 15 farms in Drakeit. So the farms may be under a. Um, no, but they still have a property tax. They're still a home. No, on but, it, but because of the agricultural use, it, uh, they're under 6, 61A. Um, yeah. it, they get a different tax status because the value for agriculture isn't sustainable. Right. Right. But my point is they want to tax the average person, but in theory, these. People are, have businesses on their property, and they're making money. They're selling, they're selling <coughs> stuff on their property. Mm -hmm. So it's, to me, that part isn't fair. Mm -hmm. If you have all this acreage, and you're not paying taxes on it, I got a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Because if they go to the problem is if they go to sell that property, they're not going to get. They're going to get way more than six hundred thousand dollars for that that property. They're going to get millions of dollars. They could. Property. So under the 61 a law, they they would um, have to give the town the first right of refusal to buy it um, for essentially conservation land. But not only... Or, the or they have to essentially, if, if that doesn't go through, they have to pay back five years prior at the regular tax rate. They have to make up that, that change. Right. But we, ha we also have other properties that have three, four, five, six acres. And if you look at them, it's the same issue. So, you know, I, I think the assessor's office needs to do some research into that because that could bring in millions of dollars. That could bring in a few million dollars in difference. In yeah, cer tax. certainly there are properties in town that are being protected by 61A that aren't fulfilling, aren't fulfilling the requirements of 61A. Right. Right. Okay. That, that's something that should be looked at. Um, but when we talk about expanding the economic tax base, and we've been, like I said, I've been off the board and we talked about economic development way back when I was on there and I was on for nine years. And when we were developing that stuff, we were pushing the management to look for bigger things. Yep. Think out of the box. And when you, the first manager you got that was brought here for economic development was Jim Duggan. Right. And as Brian Janest and her and his, uh, that's a Freudian slip, and his, his <laughs> wife said she, he was shown the door, it was because Jim was doing the things that needed to be done to expand economic development, right? You, you talk about, you talk about the, the procurement thing, they, and they try to put that on Jim, and I agree that the procurement thing was a bad thing. But Ann Vandal was the financial person. She should have spoken. She was the auditor. She was the person in charge of watching that stuff. She should have known that. Right. She should have known the procurement was in a problem, that they had a problem with procurement. 
right? She should have known that, and she didn't. Uh, I mean, you go from that to the charter review, they're always trying to control what happens so they can keep it within their power structure. And their power structure is on Lakeview Ave and the three that run the Board of Selectmen, and they're just trying to make sure that they're going to continue that in the, in the future, and you're not going to have anything change. You have people that are going to say they're not for an override, but yet you're going to get an override on the ballot, and the ballot, the people are going to have to voice again, two or three to one, to say no, and we'll have to have a campaign to stop it, right? And, and then, but they won't come up with any ideas, and then they ask you, well, what would you do? Don't ask me that. I've already told you what I would do. I've said it a hundred times. I've said it a million times. If you're not willing to expand your tax revenue base through the business <laughs> development in town, you're not going to do it. The well, identity of Drakeit is a farming community, and you can still do that, and you can still keep that identity. You know, to the point that you just made about, you know, ideas. So professionally, I, somebody gives me a program. I design a building the, for the spaces and everything, and when my client says, I don't like it, I don't say to my client, well, what do you? What would you do? Right. That's not his job. He's hiring me to right. design it. And as a matter of fact, if he starts, if typically my client starts to say, "Well, we can put this here and this here," I say, "No, no. That's what you're paying me to do. I'll do that. We're not going to sit down here and try to figure out your design. I'll come up with another design for you, and right. it'll work." And sure, you know, it, I have not been stumped yet with coming up with a design that will work. Nobody wants to close the library. Nobody. I don't want to close the library. Nobody wants to say we're not hiring more police officers. In fact, when I was on the board, I voted to expand the numbers. And those numbers are less now than they were when I was on the board. Same way with the fire. Nobody wants to, to, to limit the fire department or the DPW. Nobody wants to say don't purchase new equipment ever. That's not what we're saying. But when I bring out the point that $3 million is in this budget to purchase new equipment, I mean, you have a shortfall. Shouldn't you put that out another couple of years, maybe? I mean, are we in that? Or bond it out? Well, you, you can bond it out, but you, you, you could. But the bottom line is you're spending $3 million in tax dollars to, to replenish equipment that you should have been doing over the last 20 years. Hey, yeah, we, got a, do it all we got a comment from on, online, Trevor Courier. Yes, Trevor's a great guy. Yes, he says, our moderator appoints the Charter Review Committee in town. See? Um, I think that's a wonderful idea. And again, the, the, our town moderator appoints uh, Government Rules and Regulations Committee. Right. It seems like that's a, a, a Perfect pro, fit. appropriate fit. Perfect um, and fit. it pulls it away from the power structure of the town manager. So you're getting a separation of power there. Right. And, and, and Trevor also commented that he's, he's from Middleton. Yes. He's on the um, uh, Middleton, uh, what do you call it, Na Masco. Uh, school committee, which is a okay. con which is like a regional school because they don't have high schools in, in three or four towns in that area. He's on that school committee as a representative from Middleton, and he's um, on the Charter Review Committee, and I believe that's a committee of the people, not a committee of the politicians and the committee of the of the uh, you know the the management of the town hall, where they want to keep things pretty much the same, you know. You know they keep talking about how how over, overworked our, our staff is, and they, well, here, here's a charter review, do that too. <laughs> right, but yet... So of, it, course, well, of course, what's going to be the answer? No, it's, it's, it's done, it's, it's it okay. looks like it's okay. Do you we'll change a couple words here and there. Do you think it's a good look when you're talking about, you know, giving more work to the town? Do you think it's a good look when the town manager gives the day before uh, 4th of July off? No, uh, that was They just close town hall, totally yeah, close town hall. You think that costs us more money for overtime because contractually we got to pay the fire and the police overtime, uh, a, a, an off day rate. Yep. Because they're not getting the day off, but we, we're giving everybody else in town hall and everybody at the, you know, the DPW the time off. And a Friday is a half a day. And a Friday is already so, a half so, a day. So they could have taken, make, made Friday a full day. Right. And then given everybody the Monday off. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the day before or the day after. That, right. That's just, you think that's a good look in a time when you're $3 million in the hole? Do you think it's a good look that you give a tiff to a chosen friend of the outgoing selectman, uh, you know, to his business at the tune of $135,000? You think that's a good look? 
No, no, and certainly, I mean, TIFs are, are strong economic development tools. And I agree with tools. them. And the, the town doesn't use them until you want to give somebody a little reward on the way out. And that's, that's certainly what this appears to be. Exactly. I mean, otherwise, TIF programs could be successfully used in the Navy Yard and, and in Collinsville to help revitalize those areas. Right, but the, but the perception in a time when you're crying for more money, I'm going to give 134000 I'm going to give the manager a, a bonus of $5,000, and I know that we have a deficit. And I, I mean, the school committee is going to go out and give the uh, the superintendent of schools last June. Last June, they voted after they knew that they had a deficit in town. They gave them a twelve percent pay raise, twelve percent. And I went, I went it's back. It's only four percent. I went back and forth <laughs> with Renee Young, but it's in your budget book. It says the difference between last year's budget, where he was paid one hundred ninety-seven thousand and change, and this year's budget is 12%. It's going to $219,000. dollars back pay. Or I don't want to hear yeah. that. That's yeah. not, that's I get bull. It. That's yeah. BS. But it's still 12% more it's than it 12 was. It's 12%. Right. I got to ask you a question, John, a prediction. Yeah. So at the, the financial, uh, uh, the finance committee meeting. Yes. We got, had, we got whacked quite a bit without them mentioning our names. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. But at the end, did you see that they put up a, they put up a slide that says, and wanted to put together two people from the select yes. and two people, and they put up a slide of here's what we here's some suggestions that we think that we could do. One was a trash fee. One was to uh, eliminate the CPA tax right. for a few years, or what, reduce what, it, or, or reduce, reduce it. it. What's your prediction? Like, what do you think is going to come out? They're going to come out with a. They're going to want a ten million dollar uh, override. They're not going to do the trash fee. They threw the trash fee out a month ago. They said, we're going to do a trash fee. And then they heard such an uproar, and we started it. We put it out there. And, um, and the bottom line, so I'm going to take credit for it. The bottom line is they, they now backed off because if the fee, the trash fee doesn't hit everybody. And, of course, we got to hit everybody. <laughs> I mean, I'm okay. You know what, what I'm okay with is the mattress fee. Or if you put out a big item like a couch or something like that, and you yeah, you're I'm, charge I'm, twenty five bucks. I, you know what? I'm okay. if you're going to do something, I'm okay with that. I'm coming around on that and, yeah. and thinking that if I need to do that, I should really get the the new the people that I'm buying the mattress from to take, it, take out. it out. Right. But uh, but the bottom line is um, maybe that user fee is something that that's something we should probably. I don't know at. how much it is, if it's like $50,000 for the year or whatever. It's whatever like, it is, it's peanuts. It's peanuts compared to what we need. Right. But, right. but I'm okay, I think I'm okay with that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's still stormwater fee that- That's has, coming. Has been, it's been established, but it's a town meeting. Yeah. So, but the, the fee has not been. The, that what was, do you mean it's been voted in? It's, it's all been voted in, and, and the fee was established at zero oh. at town meeting, so they can, I believe they can raise that number at any point they want. Through With, town meeting? Not through town meeting. No, I believe that can be done by whatever commission. But I, really? when I looked at the budget, I think it was only like 338000 It's minor right now. Yeah. We're running out of time here, but the, the committee that Ann Vandal's putting together, by the way, that's a closed-door committee. That's not going to be a committee that's going to be open to the public right. to hear that debate. That's wrong, in my view. Let the people, let the people voice their opinion. Right. Transparency. Uh, we got to close out the show. That wow. hour and a half will flew by. We'll see you next weekend. Uh, we're going to be here again on Saturday, hopefully, and we'll have um, uh, Joe Reddy and um, Don Plummer. Don Plummer will be coming in for selectmen. So if, if you want to close it out, and you can't really say what you normally <laughs> say, but go ahead and close it out. <laughs> All right, uh, everyone. Thanks for watching our show. Hopefully, you learned something today. You can take that back and use it at the at the voting box uh, next month. And uh, I. Thanks for watching, and it's What's Happening, Drake. It, and this time, this special time, when it's Saturday and it's 11 a.m., it's What's Happening, Drake. It. Have a great day.